Our Lord and Father, we're so humbled and grateful to be in your presence. And as we reflect on what Christmas means, it fills us with joy. And we, we fill it out with things that are frivolous and fun because of the overflow of the joy that's happening in our hearts. We're so thankful that Jesus sent for us to make all things right in this world. That which we cannot overcome on our own was done through the Son. Because God, we live in a world that's obviously broken. We experience heartache, pain, frustration every single day. We see in the news the division that's in our country as the political extremes move further from each other. We see a lack of understanding as we can't talk and reason anymore. We see disease, we see suffering, we see war, and we see pain. And we know that this world needs to be made right. And the only way that can happen is through the submission to your son. And God, all of us, we learn to resubmit ourselves to you every day. Forgive me and forgive us for the times when we set out on our own way once again. When we leave you behind and we decide that our way is the way, that our truth is the truth and that our life is the one that matters and we build our kingdom instead of yours. But God, I pray that for all of us as a church, that Christmas would be a time of recentering, of refocusing, of realignment, of bringing our lives back once again into alignment with your standard that never changes. God, forgive us for the sins that cloud us and allow us to stand pure and righteous before you. And God, we ask that you would work in our hearts, not simply so that we can become the best version of ourselves, but God, we want to go out into this world and serve you on the mission of God. We want to change this world for you. We want to bring your light. We want to bring your restoration. We want to bring your love. We want to bring your son into the world to show how those who follow Christ, it's there that we find purpose, meaning. It's there that we find harmony. It's there that we find togetherness. And so God, as we sit here this morning and we reflect and worship, we're filled with that humble gratitude. We ask that you fill us and send us out. God, as we look now to the study of your word, I pray that you find our hearts to be open, that we would be like soil that is eager for seed to germinate and to blossom and grow, that we would be humble to see that our way is not the right way. We would realize that our thoughts are not your thoughts and our ways are not your ways and that you're going to bring our ways into alignment with yours. This is our prayer this morning. In Jesus' name. There was a very large dude man-spreading on the Long Island Railroad the other night. And uh, he was kind of like, he took his seat and like with arms and legs and packages, he took the seat next to him. And uh, Cheryl and I, we had arrived early to the train. We were just heading back from the city, uh, but it was late. And uh, we had uh, gotten our seats in another part of the car. And then it started filling up, and then an elderly couple came on, and they were just looking exhausted, and so Cheryl and I are like, oh, come on, you know, please sit, you know, we'll, we'll go somewhere else. There were no more seats left. So we went to the other side of the car where we saw the guy sprawled out all over the place, and uh, he was sound asleep, or at least he was pretending to be sound asleep, and, and, and I, I wanted to just see if anybody would admit to pretending to be asleep when you were on the Long Island Railroad so you would not have to give up your seat. Is there anyone willing to admit that? Because it did dawn on me that he was maybe pretending. But then I noticed, like, I think he really was out cold because he had, like, the drool going on. Like, and that was, that's, like, major commitment. If you're really going to, like, spit a little out and let it drool down, you're, so everyone's like, actually, don't wake the guy up. He's really actually out but, you know, I, I, didn't, I, I couldn't really blame the guy. I mean, everyone on that train looked absolutely exhausted. 
just like really totally spent. We had uh, actually uh, gone to a, a cocktail party uh, with the Viscardi Center uh, that night. And so we took the train from Carl Place and uh, we got into the city and then we walked up over to Bryant Park and we grabbed a bite to eat there and we kind of did a little bit of browsing and then kind of walked our way over toward Park and we, we went past, uh, you know, the, the, the sax lights and we kind of had to like press through the crowd because it was just, it was madness at that time. And then we get over to this beautiful place on Park where this, uh, this cocktail party was going on and had a great time with the folks at Viscardi with their team and the celebration that they were having there. It was it was really, really nice. And afterwards, we kind of decided we were going to hustle back uh, to Penn, but we wanted to stop at Rockefeller Center on the way out. And so we kind of stopped there to get some coffee and kind of worked our way through the crowd and then took a selfie with the tree and then back over the train. And that's where we found the man spreader. <laughs> and uh, so I, I'm thinking about it and I'm sitting there kind of like standing next to him. And at first I thought, you know, I'm actually getting a little upset, a little frustrated. Then I realized I wasn't actually angry. I was jealous, and he had just like a little spot next to him, and I thought, you know, I could curl up in a ball and just kind of lean in on him, and like the two of us could just cruise all the way down the line. It would be really nice, actually, and uh, I think that's just sort of par for the course around Christmas time. We get so busy. We have so much to do, and so much of it is really good stuff but there's just a lot. I mean, there's a Christmas fest hangover in this building today. And I can just feel it. I know a lot of you feel it. I mean, look, I, I, I know that the Christmas fest, you guys, the team, all you guys who did it, you were amazing last night and over the last few weeks of preparation. Thank you guys so much. It was a great time. You have gotta be tired. There's just, it's so much. And there's even that famous Christmas carol, you know, it's silver bells. It sort of hints at this, right? We kind of know it. It goes, silver bells, silver bells. It's Christmas time in the city. Then it says what? Ring-a-ling. Here, here, do we not know? Hear them ring, right? Soon it will be Christmas day. City sidewalks. Busy sidewalks. We're actually singing about the busy sidewalks dressed in holiday style as the shoppers rush home with their treasures. They rush home with their treasures. Hear the snow crunch, see the kids bunch. It's actually that guy's big day, they say. And above all this bustle, you hear silver bells. I tell you, you know, one thing you will not hear above all of the ringing and the busy and the rushing and the crunching and the bustling, you're probably not going to hear much from God. You might be able to get some of those silver bells, but you probably won't hear much from God. Now, don't get me wrong. I love all the activity and the eating, and the parties, and the eating, and the shopping, and, and the eating, and the gift giving, and the eating, and the receiving, and the, so I, I do, I love all of that stuff, but, but can't we agree that sometimes Christmas makes us feel like we just sort of want to sprawl out on the train and catch some Z's? It's somewhat different from another famous Christmas carol. Beautiful story. It, uh, some 200 years ago, there's a pastor, uh, Joseph Moore, and he was taking a quiet walk through his village. It was in Germany or Europe somewhere, and taking, taking a, a quiet walk through his village, and he was up in the hills, and he was overlooking this beautiful, snowy, quiet scene. And he was inspired in the peace and in the quietness of the Christmas season to write a poem, which he did. He wrote this beautiful little poem. And then legend has it that a couple of years later, they were getting ready for their Christmas services and the organ broke. And because the organ was broken, the songs that they were going to sing, they, just, they, they, didn't, they didn't have the, the capability to really make them sound good because they were written for organ. And so he took his little poem and he gave it to a man, Franz Gruber, and he asked him to put it into a simple melody that didn't need an organ so they could have 
a worship experience with this new song. There were some performers who were in town, they were doing some Christmas shows, and they heard this song that night, and they ended up putting it into their repertoire, and very quickly this song spread throughout two continents. It was so captivating. So what was it that made this really what's arguably the most famous of Christmas carols just run like wildfire to this day, hundreds of years later? Well, you know it. I'm going to sing it for you. It's silent. Kid, I was just messing with you. I did it. I, no, I, Billy's look. <laughs> Billy's running for the board. What's going on? He's cut. No, I'm not going to sing it for you. So it goes: Silent night, holy night. All is calm. All is bright. Round young virgin, mother and child, holy infant, so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace. The idea that this child. Can just, he can just sleep in this peace. He has the rest, all the chaos that's going to break out around him, around the Christmas story, all the chaos of the census and all the trouble that's unfolding. But there's going to be peace, and we see it later in his life because Jesus was able to do this in the midst of any sort of storm. Sleep with a heavenly peace. Silent night, holy night, son of God, loves pure light, radiant beams, from thy holy face with the dawn of redeeming grace. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Silent night, holy night, wondrous star, lend thy light. With the angels let us sing alleluia to our King, Christ, the Savior, is born. I think that this carol invites us into another path to experience Christmas, a deeper Christmas. But in order to do it, it's going to take some restraint and a whole different way of thinking about this time of year, if we're going to experience it in that way. So let's open up in a Bible to Luke chapter 2, verse 4. The Gospel of Luke was written by a man of the same name. He wrote two books of the Bible, Luke and Acts. He was a physician, a doctor, and uh, an early follower of Jesus. He also wrote a very detailed and historically accurate accounting of the life of Jesus in these two books, Luke and Acts. And uh, historians throughout the years have studied these books and realized just how accurate Luke was in the accounting of people and places and timelines and things like that. Uh, which has been uh, very exciting as people have studied it over the years to see with what detail Luke was able to record things uh, for us, uh, which is now some 2,000 years ago. Starting in verse 4. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom God his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger at the Bethlehem bed and breakfast. When they had seen him, 
they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary was having a very different kind of Christmas. The shepherds, they were startled. The crowds, they were amazed. They would marvel. In fact, we'd see this throughout his whole life. All sorts of people were coming into the story and they'd be like, wow, this is so great. Look at all of these amazing things that are being said about this guy and about the things that he's doing. And, and crowds would, would always gather up around him. That's not the way Mary was experiencing things. In fact, this verse that I want to focus on here, verse 19, it starts off with, but Mary. And scholars tell us that this is an important word that he drops in here. It's not just something to be kind of, kind of uh, sped past. He's saying, but, because he's trying to do a compare, a little contrast between everyone else in the story and how Mary was receiving it. See, something different was going on for her. The crowds, wow, neat, awesome, this is so cool. It's like a light show. How fun. I think even in our more jaded culture, there is something that still amazes people when Christmas rolls around. Something that kind of warms our hearts and makes us stand back and go, oh, this is so nice. This is so beautiful. We talk about love and family and world peace. And I think even like Republicans and Democrats, they're going to get along for like three days. Maybe. We'll see. Maybe not. But, you know, there's this idea that this is what ought to be happening. And we hear the story once again. We recite it. We hear it. We listen to it in songs. And we go, wow, this is so great. Now, lots of people today, they love the idea of Jesus. He's this wise and compassionate sage who encourages us to be good to each other. You know, he's kind of like a, an Eastern mystic version of Santa. How, what's not to like? Wow. So we get to marvel at his story. We went to the uh, Radio City uh, Spectacular, which is humbly named. Uh, and it really was great. We had an absolutely great time at it. And... Uh, while we're kind of watching it, you know, there's all this Santa stuff, and it was really, really unbelievably excellently done. I really enjoyed it. Uh, we were with a group, our family, and, and uh, all of us really enjoyed it. And then there was this kind of welcome surprise, and they bust out this living nativity, which I guess is a spoiler alert, so sorry about that. Um, but you should go check it out anyway. But it, they, they kind of switched gears, and they went into this living nativity, and you could just, you could just feel it in the air, like something had shifted. Everyone knew, like, now we were, we were talking about what really mattered. And there was kind of this wow moment, like a, yes. It might have been the live camels and stuff like that. But it was also, I just think, the whole thing. I think it was just really, really beautiful to experience. And then, and then it ends, and, and we all kind of shuffle off into the rush of Christmas because we have things to do and we have people to see and cards to mail and treasures to, to buy and we mostly just forget about the baby that was in the manger in the midst of all of the hustle and the bustle. Not Mary. We're told that Mary treasured all these things and she pondered them in her heart. This word treasured is a, is a neat idea here for us. Now, the New Testament was written in Greek, and so the, the Greek word that's here, it has the idea of, of protecting, of defending something that is of excellent value. You're, it even has the idea of preserving it for the future, and so you can imagine if you had something very, very, very valuable, you would take it and you would lock it up in a vault. That's the idea here, that you would treasure it up. So when Mary was, was taking these things she, and, and treasuring them, it's because she, she saw them with this extreme value, which is so fascinating because, of course, there, there were just truths that she had heard. That's, that's what she was treasuring. They were truths. They were the things that the shepherds had come in and told them that the angels had said. Those were the things that Mary was treasuring up among some of the other experiences that she'd had. 
So she considered these truths her most valuable possession to be gathered up, protected, preserved for the future because she knew others would need them. You can imagine that, right? This is, that's how she experiences the world. She, she wasn't looking for the new robe. She wasn't looking for some sort of like fancy new electric hybrid camel, anything like that. Like the thing that she treasured most, what she found most valuable in the world, the simple truth the angel told the shepherds. Silver Bells, it talks about how the shoppers, we, we rush home with our treasures. Treasures? Is that what those are? All the stuff you can buy, you can Amazon, you can have, I guess we don't rush home with them as much anymore. We rush out to the front door and we grab it from Amazon. But, you know, those are the treasures? Really? Do any of us in our most clear moments think that these are the real treasures of life? Of course not. We know better. But somehow it's not how we live. Something takes place. And the, and the general overall, the sense, the meaning, the importance starts to fade in this time of the year because there are so many treasures that we have to go pursue and get and give and not marry. What she treasured was something that really did matter. I think so many of us, we get wrapped up and we get distracted by all of these so-called treasures. But do we treasure the right things? Do we treasure the better things? It says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. This word pondered is even more interesting. It, uh, in all of the New Testament, only Luke uses this word. And he uses it a number of times in Luke Acts. And so he, he's the only one that uses it. And when he does, it kind of has this idea of like bringing things together. And so like if you were to, to join up with another band of people and you were to throw your lot in with their lot, it would be something like that. You'd be, you'd be kind of bringing things together. It's sort of one of the, the ideas here. But when Luke is using it in context he'll often say it, it, there's often some sort of conversing going on, something going back and forth, which is a little bit different than our idea of pondering. So like in Acts chapter 4, he says, so they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and they conferred together. That word conferred is the same word that he's using for pondered. Or this one in Acts 17, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. So there's this back and forth going on. And so when, when he talks about Mary pondering these things, it's not just simply like, oh, she had a couple of neat thoughts and they kind of like kicked around in her head for, for an hour or two during you know, the month of December when we get all warm and fuzzy inside. It's not what she was doing. She grabbed them all up. She gathered them. She protected them, made them her, her deepest treasure. And then she pondered them. She interacted with them. There was some sort of conversation going on in her soul in an ongoing and a regular way, going back and forth. Who was she going back and forth with? It was, see, I think it was, it's, it's more than simply just occasionally letting your mind drift to it. I think she was ruminating on these things. She was mulling them over again and again, what we might even call meditating on them. I think she was revisiting them again and again. I would even say that she was asking questions of those truths and letting those truths ask questions of her. You see, there is an interaction, a conversation. Perhaps she was even having a conversation with God about these things. This is very hard to do in the midst of all the hustle and the bustle. I think Mary, she was trying to penetrate the significance of everything that was happening. She was spending time with it in a non-distracted, focused, a disciplined way. Turning it over in her mind and in her heart, trying to see what it means for her and for her family and for her people, perhaps even for the world. But does your, does your life during this season, does your life allow for this sort of disciplined pondering of these great truths? It's so easy for us not to do this, to let that fall to the wayside because we're simply too busy. 
What were these simple truths that the angel t- told the shepherds? Luke chapter 2, verse 10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Messiah, the Lord. Silent night, they picked up, the hymn writer wrote it. Silent night, holy night, wondrous star, lend thy light. With the angels, let us sing alleluia to our King. Christ, the Savior, is born. You know, we sing these words, but do we really think through what they mean for us? Simple truths that are treasured by Mary. Simple truths that are pondered above all else in her heart. Look at the next verse of it. It's silent night, holy night, son of God, loves pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face with the dawn of redeeming grace. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. I'd heard someone once say that, you know, they, when they, heard, well, they used to sing this as a song, right? Silent night, holy night, son of God loves pure light. If you, if you don't know the punctuation, you think, oh, the baby loves the radiant light, you know, the, the light that's shining down. But when you, read the, when you see it with the punctuation, you realize, no, 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 the son of God is, loves pure light. He is the purest manifestation of God's love. How is that? Well, it's because he is, in fact, savior of the world. Love came down and God wanted us to not miss how desperately he loved us. And he decided the best way to show us was to send Christ. The purest picture of the love of God. He calls it the dawn of redeeming grace. This was the beginning the birth of Christ. It was the beginning of the work of the Savior. We would experience redeeming grace for us and for our families and for our communities and for our world. This was the dawn of it. He was Lord at thy birth. These simple truths that she treasured treasured above all else was that Jesus is both Savior and King. He longs to save you. Will you let him? So often we still resist, but this is God's purest expression of his love. Will you let him save you? Will you allow that truth to so captivate you that it impacts every part of your life? Will you bring it in? Will you hold it dear? Will it become the single most important thing that you possess in this world? Will it transform the way you interact with the world around you? And then will you surrender to that king? You know, there was a day when we had kings where you would, if you were to come in the presence of the king or the king was to kind of move into your region or you were to move into that region, you'd, you'd, you'd pledge your loyalty to the king. You would surrender yourself to him. We don't use that language anymore. In fact, we despise this idea of surrendering ourselves to another. And yet, the scriptures do not hesitate to use this kind of language when it comes to our journey with Christ, to surrender to the king. Have you done that? Have you let that become a part of your journey with God to actively surrender, to interact with him in the recesses of your heart and mind and say, I will in fact surrender. I will surrender today and I will surrender again tomorrow. And when I find areas of my life that I have refused to surrender, I will surrender them as well because he is king. King at his birth, Lord and Savior. You know, maybe you're here today and you are still resisting God. Maybe you're resisting his love for whatever reason. Maybe you're, you're really repulsed by the idea of his power. Maybe you don't like this idea that he would claim to be king, Lord of, of your life. And you say, you know what? I'm just not buying it. Maybe it's because you're not really sure of the whole Jesus thing altogether. You're here today. You're like, ah, oh, somebody took me out to church. I had to come. I totally get it because I've been there. 
And maybe you're like, you know, i just not sure I buy the whole Jesus thing. It's so long ago. I mean, it was been written so many times and copied and this and that. And, and so we, we believe these lies that we've heard over the years. And yet, when you think about how it was experienced by Mary in the early church, you'd realize just how false that picture is. Mary treasured these things as the single greatest thing she had ever learned in life. She'd ever experienced and heard. She treasured these things. In fact, scholars tell us that the language here that Luke is using is different. So much so they'd say it sounds like he had source documents, which of course Luke tells us he did. He says he went through and he interviewed all of the people who were involved in these epic, momentous uh, situations, he interviewed them to find out what was going on, and then he copied down what they said, which is why some of his language shifts from this place to another place in the gospel, which means he most certainly spoke to Mary herself, who had treasured these things and preserved them for the future, and Luke did the exact same thing. With the accuracy and precision of a doctor, he wrote these things down for us so that we too would know, that we would be able to trust these eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus. And listen, you are, you are never going to go particularly deep in your faith and in your journey with God if you refuse to trust what these folks told us happened. You just, you're going to be stopped. You're going to hit a block. You're going to hit a point where you just can't go past it because you can't just take the wow of Christmas without the Lord and Savior of Christmas. And if you're feeling there's something missing, and that might be what, like something stirring up in your heart, it might very well be that. The need to finally say, I am going to surrender. And it opens up so many possibilities for us then. Instead of rushing after cheap treasures, we get to fill our hearts and our minds with this, this love of Christ that we see in his role as Savior. You know, maybe you're struggling right now because you just simply value the wrong things. You've bought in to the lies. Maybe you're wrapped up in the materialism of Christmas. And maybe this simple truth means that you don't have to find your worth and your value in your possessions. You can get off of this treadmill of pursuing happiness or status or security in the things that you buy. And what a gift it would be to shift your focus on what your real treasure is. Listen, you have a new king, and your king is wealthy beyond compare. He has the cattle on a thousand hills. He has a room that he is setting aside in his great estate just for you. And here we are pursuing trinkets. Maybe we're dealing with greed because we buy into the lies that the world says that we are the sum of our possessions. And maybe we have yielded, we've yielded to these subtle manipulations of this whole materialism machinery that distracts our souls from what really matters. You know, we, why are we fretting over these, these pennies and, and petty promises when the king of the universe is now here and he is waiting for us to surrender ourselves to the fullness of his joy and delight and privilege. And he's saying you can give up your worries and your fears and your anxiety and your distractedness and your self-centeredness. Surrender it to the king. Don't chase after the next shiny thing when this radiant glow of true treasure is ours for the taking. Treasure Christ. His promises to us. Lock them up tight in our hearts and in our minds and let them then grow into that treasure that we will value above all earthly things. We're going to actually give you an opportunity to make a decision like this in just a few moments here. To, to be able to to, to rededicate yourself to securing the one true treasure on the th in the throne of your life. You know, maybe today you've come in here and you're just simply pressed into this frenetic pace. You're hurrying and bustling and, and I, maybe you don't even know why. It's just what happens. It's just what we have to do. But do we? Do we really? 
We've heard it said before that we have to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. And I'd say that that is truer now during this time of the year than any time to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives because you simply cannot love in a hurry. You simply cannot hear from God when we are rushing about all and every day from the very moment we wake up through restless sleep at night. The hustle and the bustle, it can be certainly fun and there's a big part of it that we want to be able to keep and enjoy and all of that, but we can get addicted to the noise and the activity. And that makes it, it, makes it so that we don't let God run free in our, in our minds at any point. And we wonder why we start to feel dis- disconnected from him and his deeper promises to us. I want us to be able to set aside that time. In fact, I want to challenge you. You've got the rest of December ahead of you, right up into the new year. Do you have a daily discipline of treasuring and pondering the Savior? Do you take time every day, sometime in the morning works best for many, maybe it's later in the day, find, I I know people that set a timer that goes off in the middle of the day and they just peel away from everything they're doing. That's really hard for me, but you know, but to start your day, to end your day, something. Take some time. If you've never done it before, start with 10 minutes. If you, if it's a regular discipline, then kick it into every single day. If if you've done it for, for 15 minutes, add it, add five, 10 minutes and just Reflect, meditate, mull over these things. Ponder them in your heart. And let these great truths of of Jesus as King and Savior, let them transform you and this season that we're a part of. I'm going to ask the band to come up. They're going to lead us in a worship song. After that song, we're going to invite you guys who, who want to come up to make a declaration that today is that day that you are going to reset what you treasure. You're going to rededicate yourself to pursuing him in all of his love and splendor as king. Maybe you've never done that before. Maybe you're going to feel a little uncomfortable with it. Who knows? But we're going to give you an opportunity here. I'm just going to say a word of prayer. Let them uh, lead us in a song, and then I'll come back up in a moment. So let me, let me pray for each of you. Would you guys stand? Father, every one of us knows what it's like. We come here, we rush, we run, we push, we pull. And at the end of it all, we're like, ugh, just a little bit glad it's over. Because we haven't treasured you. What we need, Lord, in the midst of the fun and the busyness, in the midst of the gifts, Lord, what we need is to have you rooted firmly in our hearts. That's what we want, to treasure you above all else, to meditate on our Savior, to surrender to him as our King, and to do that each and every day. I'm praying, Lord, that as we worship, as we sing songs of praise, that you would do a work in each person's heart, that you would be drawing them ever closer to yourself. We ask it in Christ's name.